Let me pray, uh, and we're going to continue our series in the book of Genesis. Today, we're looking at Mankind 2.0. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for allowing us just to gather in this place, to worship you, to remember what's really uh, important, what really matters. And so God, help us to align ourselves with you this morning, to be open to what your word and your spirit wants to teach us this morning. And so God, just... Uh, um, Open up our hearts and our minds. Help us to be attentive because uh, you have something for each and every one of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, we tend to think of Genesis. I heard this illustration this last week and I loved it. We tend to think of Genesis as a house story. And we think about the materials and how it was built and what kind of foundation and what kind of roofing. Did it have solar, double pane windows, uh, you know, low flow toilets? Hopefully not. Um, but, but Genesis is not a house story, it is a home story. It's about creation that God creates, that, that the garden, and puts the first man and the first woman really in a home, in a place where they belong, where everything, all of creation, from the stars to the sand, to the water, to the rain, everything is for Adam and Eve, so that they can thrive, so that they can uh, fulfill their meaning and purpose in life. And so more than history, Genesis is giving us the meaning of history. See, science can tell us the how, and sometimes they can tell us the how, but they cannot tell us the why. And that is what Genesis is really all about. And so in contrast, to ancient cultures. Remember, we always got to remember that the Bible is not written to us, but it was written for us. And, and this is the beauty and the unbelievable, magnificent beauty of especially these first few chapters of the book of Genesis. Written some 4,000 years ago, events that occurred at least maybe 5,000 years ago, maybe even beyond that. And yet, it is still so fully packed with meaning and significance. And it speaks to us today. It's a beautiful blueprint of how people can thrive in this world, how families can thrive, how marriages can thrive in this world. It's a blueprint for marriage, for work, for gender, for sex, for sexuality, for healthy relationships. It is also a blueprint of how we are to relate, uh, not just to one another, but to God. How we are to relate to nature, to uh, the animal kingdom, and all that God made. So much, and we don't really think about this, but so much of what has influenced the Western world is found right here in these first few chapters. Think about it. The dignity and worth of every human being. We didn't just make that up. We're not that smart, human beings. Uh, but God here tells us that, that male and female, they were made in the image of God. And so we believe that that applies to people that are born with handicaps. We believe that applies to the unborn. We believe that it applies no matter what your skin color may be or your gender may be. We also see here that mankind was meant to be free. F freedom for, not freedom from, but freedom for. There's something innate in every single human being that longs to be free. Uh, think about the animals, and some of you are real animal lovers here, and that's good. God made the animals. It is never right to exploit or to abuse an animal and nature as well. And yet mankind, we see it happen around the world where mankind finds a way to exploit nature, to extract from nature uh, in a way that is harmful and damaging to nature. We are given the responsibility as human beings, above all else, above all other creation, to be stewards of this world. Marriage. We see a blueprint for marriage. One woman, one man. We see purpose and meaning. And part of that purpose is to love and be loved by God. Part of that purpose is to work and to find significance in the things that we do. In fact, 
One of the things that psychologists tell us when it comes to dealing with depression, and as someone who's dealt with depression most of his life, we need to sometimes just get up and do something. Just get up and do something. Um, God created us, human beings. We are beings, not human doings. We don't get our, perp- our significance from doing things, but doing things is important. It flows out of who we are and how God created us to be. And then work. And I talked about this last week. I won't get too much into it. But, but really, when we think of work, I'm not, I'm not talking about income. Income is important. And when you can marry income with work and purpose and meaning, it's a beautiful thing. But ultimately, we've got to ask the question, is what I'm doing, is it helping humans thrive in this world? Or is my work just a way to get a paycheck, just to, just to make money, just to get uh, something out of it? We can get caught up in work. We can make work an idol. I talked about that last week. In fact, I read a story about a very, very successful businessman in San Francisco who started a school for entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are my favorite people. They are job creators. They are business creators. They help make this engine run in a free market economy. But this particular businessman who started 165 schools worldwide, and of those graduates, they have started nearly 3,000 companies around the world, but he was depressed. You know why he was depressed? Because his roommate was Elon Musk. (laughs) He was comparing himself in success. We do it too. We do it too. But maybe the most important thing that Genesis teaches us, and I've said this over and over, it is a blueprint for who God is. It tells us that God is good, that God is a providing God, that God is a transcendent God. You know what I mean when I use the word transcendent? It means that he is above and apart from all else, from everything else that is created. He is not only transcendent, that means he supersedes all else of creation in this tiny, tiny in this massive universe, but he is also what the scholars call imminent. Imminent means that he is present and close to all of creation, but he is distinct from it. We see God as a personal God here, not an arbitrary, angry superhuman that lives up in the clouds that is angry, uh, and, and especially at mankind, and just wants us to work and toil. He's a personal God. He's a transcendent God, but a personal God at the very same time. He's a God who loves beauty. He's a God who speaks. He's a God who knows and is knowable. And and that is, especially in ancient times, that was a foreign concept. In fact, I think it was Aristotle who said, (laughs) man could never have a personal friendship with God. And in his mind, he's thinking of Zeus. I mean, who sings you know, songs to Zeus. Who sings, you know, Zeus loves me, this I know. (laughs) That song doesn't exist. Because in his mind, how could a God that is so superior to mankind, how could he ever relate? How could he ever lower himself to relate to mankind? And that is the gospel. He did. He lowered himself to relate to you and to me. Jackie Hill Perry, I'll I'll mention one of her books uh, later on in the message, but Uh, She wrote a book called Good Girl, no, sorry, Gay Girl, Good God. It's a great read. I love what she has to say. And she was talking about this idea of God's transcendence and God being holy. That's what the word holy means. It means set apart. He said, if she said, if God is holy, then he can't sin. Think about that. If someone says to you in a debate, about atheism or agnosticism, is there anything God can't do? Well, yeah, God can't sin. He can't violate his very character and nature. And if God can't sin, then guess what? He can't sin against you. Shouldn't that make him? And this is where some of us struggle, if we're really honest. So this is where some of us struggle. Shouldn't that make him the most trustworthy being that there is. Some of us have a hard time trusting God. And maybe it's because trust has been violated in the past. We've had our trust broken in order to trust again can be difficult. 
But as we move on, in this passage in chapter 2. By the way, if you have your Bibles, you can open up to chapter 2. Just real quickly, just a reminder. Chapter 1 is kind of an overview of all of creation. God made everything that there is, including mankind, male and female, he made them. In chapter 2, it's kind of like a, a God, a, the author hones in and gives us a closer, more intimate perspective of the creation of Adam and Eve. So I'm going to pick it up again in verse 7, chapter 2, verse 7. It says, then the Lord God formed. And again, that word is really important. It's the picture or image of an artist. God formed a man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. God the artist. Forming. Taking dust and then breathing life into that first human being. And by the way, he breathed life into all living creatures, but there was something unique and different about, it's a different word, it's only used here in chapter 2, and it really has to do with what makes mankind different from all other created animals. It's, it's, it's what scholars might say, this is the, what gave us the soul. This is what gave us the spirit, that ability to connect with God, that ability to have a relationship with Him. And I want to remind you, I've, I've talked about this before, but it's been a long time, of what it means to be human. Here is, is kind of a, just a, a simple diagram of, of all the components of what it means to be human. We're given a mind. We're given a will. We're given emotions. We're given a spirit. We're given uh, sexuality. These are all th things that are wrapped up in a body, and it's what it means to be human. And I want you to think for a moment. We talk about this in my theodicy class right at the beginning because it's so critical to understand what God is up to in your life. If you think God just created you to be a good, moral, ethical person, you're missing it. Yes, that's like the minimum of it. It is that, but it is so much more than that. I think about what it would have been like for Adam to have a mind that is uncluttered. No ADD originally, right? Just, just the ability to focus, the ability to think brilliantly, deeply, nuance. I mean, just a mind that is completely free of clutter, of being burdened. And then you think about emotions. Adam and Eve were created with emotions. It's part of what makes us in his image. And yet those emotions were balanced. Those emotions were never uh, out of sort. Um, in fact, Jesus is maybe the perfect model of what it means to be a man. And, and, and we see that Jesus experienced all of the emotions that you and I experienced, but they were never done wrong. They're always appropriate for every situation. He had a conscience. Adam and Eve were given a conscience. And, and that is that, that center in what makes you you that determines right from wrong. It, your conscience can feel guilty or overburdened. Your conscience can be free. Your conscience, by the way, can be cut off. It can be severed. It can be um, broken. But Adam and Eve had a perfect conscience, and it was, it was this image of a sprinter leaning forward, ready to go, ready to obey, ready to do everything that God wanted him to do. And by the way, that has a lot to do with the will, too. We all struggle with willpower. I have no willpower when it comes to potato chips at night. I, I struggle, and you think it's funny. It's not. I'm Pray for me. <laughs> um, but, but we all have things where we are, you know, the will just, we don't have it. We know we should, and just we struggle with the willpower to do it. But Adam and Eve had that perfect willpower. And then, of course, Adam and Eve were given sexuality. It was male and female. And I'm going to talk more about that later in the message. But then, verse 15, the Lord took the man. Only Adam has been made right now. Took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden, and said to work it and to take care of it. To work and to take care of it, to protect, to develop it, to partner with creation, with nature, and do something beautiful. I believe Adam was intended to not just clip, you know, weeds or, or you know, trim or, or, or that kind of stuff in the garden. I believe they were put there, and eventually, generation after generation after generation, that garden would eventually grow and become 
the entire planet. But they didn't get very far, did they? That's coming up next week on page three. But he was made outside the garden. I find that fascinating that Adam was made outside the garden and then put into the garden to work and to take care of it. But the passage goes on in verse 16 and says, The Lord God commanded the man, you are free. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're going to talk about that next week. What does that mean? What is the knowledge of good and evil? For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, three things I want to share with you this morning. As we go on in this passage, we're going to see that something is not good. We're going to see something is not good enough. But then we're going to see someone is just right. It's almost like a, uh, what, what's that story of the three bears? Goldilocks story. Uh, just right. So something's not good. Let's look at what is not good. For the very first time uh, in history, God says, it is not good. And I want you to see what's not good. It's not good for the man to be alone. And so he says, I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, while this is about marriage, it is also about what it means to be human. It is not good to be alone. Isolation is not good. We are coming out of over a two-year worldwide experiment of isolation. And there's all kinds of research and articles and papers coming out week after week. I hear about them almost every week. How much damage isolation has done, especially to young people. But this is not about marriage. This is not about singleness. It's about friendship. It's about companionship. It's about community. And I want you to notice that sin has not entered into the world yet. Adam and Eve is not a sinner. He's not lonely because he did something wrong. He's alone because that's the way God designed him to be, to not be alone. But right now he's alone. And, and here's what gets really interesting. He acknowledges that Adam is alone and the first thing he does is give him a job. You're going to work. Now, now, pay attention here, men, especially men. Work cannot be a substitute for healthy, thriving relationships. I'll leave it at that. But I also want you to notice that um, the church, by definition, is community. The way God designed us as human beings is to thrive in relationship with God and with one another. And for someone to say, I love Jesus, but I don't love the church, that is a huge, dangerous path to walk on. I've used this example before. The church is the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. Now, if you come and tell me, Adam, I really like you, but your bride, I really don't want anything to do with your bride. We don't have a friendship. It's not going to work out. Um, yes, it's messy. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, church is complicated. And we hurt and offend. The question is not, are we going to hurt and offend one another? It's when. And are we going to lean into it and work through it together? There was a study done in Australia on happiness. And the very first thing that the study acknowledges that happy people have is what? Healthy relationships, healthy friendships. Psychologists have taught us about the importance of human beings bonding. Now, I'm not sure if you've ever thought much about this or learned much about this, but, but we have all heard the stories of children who have all of their physical needs met. They're fed, they're warm, they're clothed, they have a place to sleep. But if they are denied all of those other important intangibles like love, like holding, touching, facial, uh, looking each other in the eyes. If a child doesn't have those things, it has an incredible impact on them psychologically, emotionally, and physically. In fact, kids who grow up without experiencing that bonding, and what I mean by that is that there's this deep connection that takes place where you feel you belong, 
and you feel secure. You feel safe in that relationship. And that first relationship kids have is with the mother and father. And so if you introduce abandonment, if you introduce abuse, if you introduce uh, a whole host of other things that hinders that bonding from taking place, they will tend to spend the rest of their lives both avoiding it and looking for it, but in all the wrong places. Someone who does not bond at a young age with those closest to them um, tend to have smaller brains, slower development, tend to have emotional problems, tend to be dominated by fear, anxiety, insecurity, doubt. They tend to be very timid. They don't trust anyone. They keep everyone at arm's length. And they, then add to that relationship problems. Difficulty in marriage, difficulty raising kids, difficulties at work often, wherever there's relationships needed, they tend to struggle. But when people are in healthy relationship, when we're able to experience that deep bonding, especially at a young age, it's something we can get later in life, because I know as I'm talking to this crowd, and you don't have to tell me because I know many of you, many of you, uh, this is triggering memories from your upbringing and your childhood and some of the things that you missed out on that weren't given to you. But it's still something that you can find in community with other people and in relationship with God. That's the most important person to bond with is God. And when we experience that, we tend to live longer lives, live healthier lives. We have more peace, less stress, less anxiety. We have a sense of safety or security. We kind of know where we belong. We know who has our back. We have lower blood pressure, stronger immune systems, faster recovery from illnesses. In fact, people, they say, with deep, meaningful relationships are at a much lower risk for heart disease. So it's not just being alone. There are all kinds of other implications that go along with that. And it's meaningful connectedness. And this is where it really rubber meets the road. Meaningful connectedness allows us to work through all the crap in life, all the pain, all the trauma, all the bad things that happen in life. It is in relationship, meaningful friendships. In fact, one of my favorite Christian counselors says that if more Christians had deep, meaningful relationship with others, psychologists wouldn't be needed. Most of us know what it's like to feel bad. We don't like negative feelings. In fact, we, especially in America, where we're told we deserve and we ought to feel good and watch every commercial. That's what it's the message is giving to you. You deserve to feel good. But the opposite of feeling bad is not feeling good. Because we can do anything, you know, short term to feel good. We can smoke dope. We can uh, go buy something. We can, you know, go for a drive along the coast. Nothing, well, maybe don't smoke dope. But nothing wrong with some of those other things. Uh, but remember when we talked about happiness, we talked about caffeine happiness. It kind of gives us a quick bump, but it doesn't last. The opposite of feeling bad is not feeling good. The opposite of feeling bad is feeling loved. There's a big difference between just feeling good and feeling loved. And so, to quote that amazing 70s song, people who need people are what? The luckiest people in the world. Maybe, maybe change it to people who recognize they need people, are the luckiest people in the world. But God says to Adam, I will make a helper. Some of you ladies, I noticed you cringed when I said that. A helper suitable for him. In our English word, it's unfortunate. What's interesting in scripture, the particular Hebrew word here, it is always translated sigh. I'm sorry, I got the wrong word. Um, it's unfortunate because the word helper implies inferiority. Whenever I do a wedding, I usually get up and I talk about this because I want people to have a biblical understanding of what marriage is. And God made Eve to be a helper suitable. But it does not imply inferiority. It does not imply less than. In fact, that very same word that's used helper for Eve here is also used of God. Think about that. 
In Psalm 33, verse 20, it says, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help. Does, does, does God, is God inferior to us because he helps us? <laughs> I, I always tell the groom, I say, God made you to need a helper because you need help. <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 70 says this, but as for me, I am poor and needy. Come quickly to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer, Lord. Do not delay. So God says there's one thing not good. Uh, before I go on though, what is the implication for you? What is the implication for you in terms of where you're at in life right now, where you're at in your journey of faith? Maybe you don't even have faith in God. Maybe you're just, someone tricked you into being here today. I, um, I, I don't know. But, but where are you? <laughs> I, I didn't hear it. Say it louder or I'll miss it. Um, but, but, but where are you in terms of having meaningful friendships? And the reason I emphasize that, you know, this isn't just about marriage. Because it's one thing to be alone. It's a whole nother level to be married and alone. Some of you know that. But is there a step that you need to take? Is there a, maybe join the, a Bible study, maybe start a Bible study, maybe uh, take something to the next level. There is nothing more important to your spiritual life in that deep connection with God and that deep connection with other people. So, something is not good and God is going to show us that, well, there's something that's not good enough as well. Now, the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Now, notice God named Adam and then he gives Adam the job of naming the animals. See, there's this relationship with God where we partner with him for the flourishing of this world and of people and of this life. Whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. And so the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. Adam, it's not good to be alone. Here's a job. Here's a bunch of animals. Now, I'm not reading into this passage. We've got to be really careful about reading into a passage something that's not there. But, but I've, I've heard scholars and I've heard pastors uh, talk about, well, um, Adam, dog, man's best friend, right? No. We're to have a good relationship with nature. We're to treat animals with dignity as, as part of God's creation. Doesn't mean it's not okay to eat them. Um, but at least at this point in life, at least at this point in creation, they are vegetarians, both animals and Adam and Eve. But animals cannot take the place. It cannot fulfill the void of having deep, meaningful relationships with others. So it's not good enough. But thirdly, and this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time, there is someone that is just right. But for Adam, to pick it up in chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 20, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. It's almost as if God put Adam in a place to make that loneliness felt at a deep level. You're not going to fulfill that void in work. You're not going to fulfill that void in nature, not even with animals there is something unique that is just right to meet that perfect void that is in your life. And so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with the flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and that he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. And some will say this is the very first wedding ceremony. And the man sings. He breaks out in music. He breaks out in song, in poetry. The man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. 
She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And that is why a man leaves his father and mother. Adam and Eve didn't have a father and mother, right? He's being told here to leave his father and mother. That's why we look at this as a blueprint. And be united to his wife, and they become one flesh. That's that bonding. That's that deep, intimate relationship. And here's what it looks like. The very next next verse, very last verse of chapter 2. And Adam and Eve were both naked and felt no shame. No shame. We'll talk about how shame plays a role in our lives uh, next week. But I want you to see that at this point, this is creation perfected. A man and a woman in perfect relationship with God, in perfect relationship with nature, in perfect relationship with one another. If you're single, bear in mind just a couple things. Jesus was single, and he was joyful. Paul was single. Mother Teresa was single. God may have marriage for you, but he may not. I don't know. I'm not God. My advice to single people who want to be married, run after God. Focus on your relationship with God. Become the person. Don't look for the right person. Become the right person. And every once in a while, if you're running toward God, look to see who's running along with you. But I will tell you, being alone is tough. Marriage is tough too. Some of you know that. But you can live a life that is full, that thrives, that is full of meaning and significance and purpose, and be single. It is not the end all, being married. Now, I've pointed out the fact that Adam and Eve, or Adam was made in the wilderness and Eve was made in the garden. I don't know if that tells us anything about the differences between men and women. One pastor said, and I disagreed with him, he says, men are to be outside working, women are to be in the home working. And I said, ah, that's kind of reading too much into it. Uh, I'm thrilled that women can work today. I'm thrilled that women can do jobs that men can do. Uh, I think they should be able to do the job physically. Um, You know, I mountain bike a lot. You guys know that. And one of the things that I see in the last five years, uh, it's just exploded the number of women mountain biking. And I think it's great. I see more women out there than men mountain biking. Um, I think women, because they were made in the image of God, can do almost anything that men can do. But men can't do everything women can do either. So uh, let's, uh, here's the point. Uh, It's unfortunate that most translations use rib. It's only used rib here. The very same word, every other time in scripture, I think some 41 times, is translated side. And I think there's a really important, significant reason that Eve was made from Adam's side. And I think it has a lot to do with because we are meant to be equal. We're not the same, but we are equal. There are differences about men and women that we cannot ignore. Um, But it is interesting that God would put Adam to sleep. Our minds in scientific age go to, well, it's kind of like anesthesia, put him to sleep so he doesn't feel the pain. But no ancient person would have thought of that. What they would have thought of is maybe dreams or other things. I, again, I don't, I don't know exactly what that has to do with. One guy suggests that, well, this is why men like to take naps. <laughs> um, and because Eve was brought on later, women are always late. I, I don't know. Is that? I'm not saying that's true. I'm not saying that's what... You can't read more into Scripture than is there. You've got to be careful. But, and here's where science helps us, because we live in a day and age where there's a lot of confusion about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. While we are equal, we're also different. For example, did you know that there are many more birth defects in male than in female. And part of the reason is because men have an X and a Y chromosome. 
Women have two X's, and so they have a copy. Uh, and so if something goes wrong, it's just less likely that something's going to go wrong. Men tend to run warmer than women, just the body temperature, although that is not true in my relationship with my wife. I'm always the cold one. Um, <laughs> women are better about talking about their feelings, which, by the way, and men, you're going to thank me for this. You're going to be glad you came to church today. Um, it's actually a function of the brain. And women have something men don't that makes it easier for them to talk about emotions and feelings. Women have a verbal centers on both sides of their brain, whereas men have a verbal center only on one side. And so ladies, give us a break. We're not always good at talking about it. It's biological. It, you know, we can't help it. Um, but there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, but men... Because of the way our brains are designed, we tend to be able to compartmentalize things better. And this is really critical. This is why men tend, I'm being general here, tend to respond in an emergency with a lot more calm because they're able to compartmentalize, they're able to shut out. By the way, that's why if a man's watching a game on TV, he's not going to hear anything going on. <laughs> he's not going to hear you, and it's a function of the brain. Uh, women's brains mature faster, frontal lobe manages impulse control and the ability uh, to understand consequences, which is why young men especially, because young men's brains don't fully form until they're 26 to 30. That's why a lot of young men do dumb things. <laughs> no, seriously, that's why they take more risks, that's why they take more chances, you know, fast cars, whatever it is. Uh, men have a different brain. It's science. It's, it's just the way we were wired. Women actually see more color. Uh, if a person is colorblind, it's likely to be a man. Um, men, though, have a spatial advantage when it comes to our eyesight uh, and that ability to spatially recognize things, which tends to lead to men pursuing the field of science, technology, engineering, and math much more than women. Now, again, I'm being general here. We have friends who have a daughter. She's going to get her PhD in math and aerospace technology. She's brilliant. But men tend to head toward those fields more often. Society and stereotypes play a role as well. Men physically are stronger in most cases. Not always. There's some women that could kick my butt. Um, <laughs> But men tend to be stronger. They have, and it, this is at a biological level, down to their bones. They have 50% more upper body strength. Uh, osteoporosis is typically more of a concern for women. Women are far more likely to experience depression. And that might be because they have uh, just the way their brain is wired. Uh, women, by the way, multitask much easier than men. But men are far, far more likely to commit suicide. And men are far more likely to be predisp predisposed to alcoholism. Um, now, I realize I'm tiptoeing in today's culture um, on a very sensitive, very controversial subject. Um, so let me back up just a sec. Before I continue, I want to remind you of three things. One, everyone is made in the image of God. That gives them inherent value. That gives them dignity. And we treat, as Christians, we are called, even with people we disagree, to respect and treat everyone kindly. Second thing, the church has failed in large part in how it has approached these controversial issues, especially things like gender and sex, has failed. Um, we are to, with wisdom and in the Spirit, speak the truth in love. Now, if we're all truth, you know what? We're bullies. We're Bible bashing. We're hitting people over the heads with the truth. It does no good. We must speak the truth. We can't ignore the truth. We must be loving. And if all we have is love and just ignore the truth, one, it's not really love, and two, it creates a culture of chaos. And so, 
we must, and that's the third point, be informed by Scripture, not culture. We must be informed by Scripture, not culture. Now, the term that is used today when it comes to gender um, and where our culture is moving quickly, uh, some of us are just astounded at how fast things have changed over the last 10 years. But the word that is commonly used is the word gender dysphoria. Used to be called, uh, in medical terms, gender identity disorder. Um, but disorder is a negative connotation, and so they have moved to gender dysphoria. And it is the feeling or discomfort or distress that might occur in someone who feels different about themselves than the way they were born. And what many of us need to hear today is that that is a real thing. It is a real thing. It's not made up. It's not fake. It is a real thing. And it is an issue that must be addressed with compassion, with prayer, and with truth, and with love. Let me recommend a couple books that I've recommended in the past. Uh, the first one is called Embodied. Uh, Preston Sprinkle, to me, does the best job at talking about these very difficult, very controversial issues. He helps churches, travels around the country, helping churches deal with the LGBTQ2 plus thing in a very gracious way without compromising truth. I mentioned um, Jackie Hill Perry. She wrote Gay Girl, Good God. And then this is a book not written by a Christian, but it was banned. Some of you might have remember this last year. Maybe it was two years ago it came out and it was banned from bookstores, from libraries. It's called When Harry Became Sally. When Harry Became Sally. And it is a very um, healthy, scientific, looking at the data approach to what is happening in our culture today. But I think the shift really began to take place back in 2016. You guys remember this guy, Bruce Jenner? Um, used to be on the Wheaties box, uh, became Caitlyn Jenner. He was interviewed by Diane Sawyer, and I, I was struck by two things that he said. One of the things that he said was that God's looking down, making little Bruce. He's talking about when God made him. And God says, okay, what are we going to do with this one? Let's make him a smart kid. Let's make him determined. And then he goes on, and he says, and then God looked down and chuckled a little bit and said, hey, Let's give him the soul of a female. Now, first of all, that is a very toxic, distorted view of God. That God would play games. That God would, would laugh, and chuckle, and, and purposely cause harm and conflict within a little boy. But then later on in the interview, he said this, I hope that God will forgive me. There's a lot packed in that sentence. There's a lot that I wish yeah. I could have asked him and had him flush out on what he really meant by that. But the poster child for the last year or so has been this person, uh, a guy named Leah Thomas. Now what's interesting is Leah Thomas is a swimmer, um, has not fully transitioned into being a female, but is taking hormones. And he is shattering women's uh, records every time he gets in the pool. He's winning by a mile. And because of the current culture, all the women on the team from Penn State, I believe, are kept silent, afraid to say anything. Well, they begun to say things. They put a petition together. New York Times picked up uh, this and wrote an article about it. Uh, and I found it very interesting. And what they are coming to realize is that no matter what a person feels like in, elect, you know, in their soul or in their mind, whatever gender, and by the way, um, I'm now told I think there's 82 options to choose from when it comes to gender. But what the science says is that even a physical male, even with hormones, is almost always going to outmatch a female. Surgery set aside, hormones set aside, it is almost always the case. Let me give you an example. And the New York Times article uses this example of Allison Felix. A few years ago, Allison Felix, one of the top sprinters in the world. Records all over the place uh, have since been beat, but 
She ran the 400 meter race in 49.2 seconds. That's screaming. But you know, in 2018, 275 high school boys beat that record. There's just a difference between men and women, even at the biological level. And men tend to be stronger. In fact, Peter said in his uh, letter to the Christians, um, especially to husbands, he said, husbands, dwell with your wives in an understanding way, for they are weaker. Now, what's Peter saying there? He's not putting you down, women. He's saying that your husbands can probably beat you in an arm wrestle. He's not talking about spiritual strength, emotional strength, psycho. In fact, women are much stronger than men in so many different ways. But when it comes to physical strength, men tend to be the stronger of the two. President Biden recently quoted Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, where it says that he made even people with gender dysphoria in his image. And he's right. Yes, God made everyone, even str someone struggling with gender dysphoria. He's made everyone in his image. But he left out what it said after that, male and female. He made them. So as Christians, um, again, we may be hated, we may be told that we are haters, but we believe in male and female. There are two genders. I think maybe what we need to consider as part of the discussion is what we consider to be masculine and feminine. And, right? I mean, th there's a scale, there's a sliding scale of what it means to be masculine. And maybe some of the things that our culture has said is masculine, maybe we need to revisit those and reevaluate what it really means to be masculine and what it really means to be feminine. Dr. Paul McHugh is a professor of psychiatry at the John Hopkins University of Medicine, said this, and he got killed for saying this. But he said, transgendered men do not become women, nor do transgendered women become men. All of them, including Bruce Jenner, become feminized men or masculinized women. Counterfeits. His words, imposters of the sex with which they identify. In that lies their problematic future. And what he's getting into and what he's saying is because this is being pushed on us in our culture. What he's saying is that you may get the surgery, you may pay, take the hormones, but you don't stop being you. And it may not produce in you the feelings that you hope it does. And so as far as LGBTQ, here's what's interesting. Baby boomers, that is if you're over 60, 68 only 2% of the population claims to be any of these letters. Gen X is 4%, but you get down to the younger generations, 21%. Now, what's happening? What's happening? That's the question we need to wrestle with because it's not a simple answer. It's, there's not a simple solution. For 60 years, and here's what I think is going on in our culture. For 60 years, our culture has preached the gospel of you can be anything you want to be. And you deserve to be happy. For 60 years, they've been telling us that. Add to that the development of our bodies. I don't know a teenager that doesn't feel insecure or uncomfortable in their own skin. It's part of development. It's normal. And then you add to that the barrage of sexual images that are introduced to young people. Younger and younger people are being introduced to porn and all kinds of forms of it. And then you add to that abuse. One in three girls, by the time they're 18, one in three, it is said, there will be some form of inappropriate sexual activity that happens to them. From inappropriate touch to rape, and everything in between. And then you add to that a lack of healthy bonding that takes place in children, it's supposed to take place with parents. Add to that social media. Add to that 
Hollywood. Add to that a culture that has incredibly messy ideas of what it means to be masculine and what it means to be feminine. Let me give you some examples. I, I love to study other cultures. I love to study history. And I find it fascinating to look at trends, to look at styles, to look at uh, other things that take place in other cultures. For example, you can go back and look at ancient Viking cultures. They all had beards, all the men, and they all had long hair. Here, here. Here, here. American culture, American Indian culture. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid and we played cowboys and Indians, I always wanted to be the Indian. Always wanted to be the Indian. Many American tribes, it is very masculine to have long hair. In fact, you go to the Maasai in Africa, the Maasai, where, where there's a revival taking place and there's all kinds of Maasai becoming Christians. Women have shaved heads, men have long hair. You go back about 100 years and newborn baby boys would have been wrapped up in a pink blanket in America. Ancient Jewish culture, real men had beards. I thank God I wasn't born Jewish in an ancient culture. I couldn't grow a beard until I was 45. I would never would have been able to fit in. There's an interesting story. You've got to love reading the Bible. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 10 says this. There was a, a foreign king named Hunan. He took David's servants, he had captured them, uh, and he shaved off half their beards. And then it says that they cut off the garments in the middle as far as, the, uh, as far as their hips. So they just cut off their garments from here. What was that king trying to do? Absolutely humiliate them. And so when they, David got word, he told them to stay in Jericho, just stay there until your beards grow back. Our founding fathers wore wigs. I'll never understand that. Scottish men wear kilts. I'll never understand that one. But really, the question, when you think about masculinity and femininity, it's changing all the time, isn't it? My wife and I, we have a great relationship. She loves to do lawn work. I like to wash dishes. Does that make me feminine? You see, we need to redefine what it means to be masculine, what it means to be feminine. Here's an example. I'm going to show you a picture of two vehicles. Okay? Go ahead and throw those up. Uh, okay? That's my wife's truck and my, my Subaru. Which vehicle's more masculine? <laughs> vehicles aren't masculine or feminine. Um, how about these two guys? These are two famous people. If you were going to define masculinity according to American culture, which one is masculine? Which one is feminine? You all need to watch the Mr. Rogers documentary. That guy was a stud. And I'll tell you what, I'm not judging the rock, but I have a suspicion he's compensating. Many men do in our American culture because we have an idea of what it means to be masculine. In fact, you know what Bruce Jenner said? One of the reasons that, that he was so compelled to excel at sports and thrive in sports is because he thought it would make him feel masculine. We need men that are athletic and strong. We need firemen. We need police. We need people that can, you know, we need military. We need people, men that can be strong and aggressive in the right way. But we also need poets. We need musicians. We need artists. So masculinity cannot be reduced to certain things that our culture has reduced it to. Growing up, I thought it meant to be masculine that I am going to like sports, and I do, uh, that I will never show emotion except anger, that I'll hate my job, I'll drink beer and cuss at the TV, and I'll stay home with the kids while my wife takes the kids to church. That's what it meant to be masculine. We need a new and better definition of what it means to be masculine. I find it very curious that a guy who is an actor and a dancer, who's five foot seven, has become a model of what it means to be masculine in our world. You guys are familiar with this guy, Vladimir Zelensky. There was articles coming out all over the place about women around the world going nuts for this guy. Five foot seven. Dancing with the stars. But you know what he did? He showed strength. He showed courage in the face of opposition. 
while our country was saying, get out, come here, go where it's safe, he says, no, I'm going to stay where it's dangerous. I'm going to stay with my people. There's something about the way he handled that situation that made women around the world swoon and go, that's what it means to be masculine. But we have a better example than Vladimir Zelensky. Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate man. He gave us example after example of what it means to be masculine. Think about his life and his ministry. Kids loved him. Ran, ran to him. Loved to be with him. Demons feared him. He wept when it was appropriate. He got angry and showed righteous indignation when it was appropriate. He asked his disciples in his greatest hour of need, stay awake with me, pray with me, I need you. He showed incredible courage when he went to the cross. He showed incredible kindness even to his enemies. He showed incredible respect for women. We see that over and over and over in the Gospels. He showed incredible self-control when he was under pressure. He rejected passiveness and he accepted responsibility. That's what it means to be masculine. And so to a culture that says, be whatever you want to be, Scripture says, be who God made you to be. Don't change who you are. To a culture that says, I deserve. Scripture says, be responsible. Take up your cross. To a culture where men use their strength to control, to abuse, or to suppress women, Scripture says real men can be gentle, can be kind, and can serve. Uh, missionaries tell me, in fact, I was interviewing some missionaries a few years ago, and they are missionaries in Turkey, which is predominantly Islamic. And women will come over and have tea and dessert with his wife. And then he will come in, and this shocks them. He comes in and does the dishes. And the women are like, you let him do that? My husband doesn't do that. <laughs> but you know what he's doing? He's modeling godly, biblical masculinity. Men can serve. To culture says, put your identity in your skin color, in your gender, in your work, or anything else. Scripture says, put your identity in Christ. You are a new creation in Christ, created for good works. The old has passed away, the new has come. And so as we take communion this morning, I'm going to invite you in a minute to come up and grab the elements, take them back to your seat, and just think, pray. What is God saying to you? What is God inviting you to today? When Jesus went to the cross, he resisted the I deserve. And he did. He resisted the, it must feel, if it feels good, it must be okay. And he took up a towel. And he took up a cross, literally. And he invites us to do the same. Male or female, take up a towel. Serve. Take up your cross. We all have a cross to bear. For some of you, it's your sexual identity. For others of you, it's greed. For others of you, it's self-centeredness. For others of you, you, you name it. There, there's no exclu nobody's excluded here. We're all sinners. We all fall short of God's glory. We are all in need of grace. And that's what we are reminding ourselves of when we come and take communion. We're reminding ourselves that we are in need of grace. Father, thank you for um, your beautiful creation, your beautiful design. And God, it's broken. We're all broken. We all struggle here with various things. But God, this morning, uh, we want to, as I said earlier, align ourselves with you. Realign ourselves with you. And God, as we wrestle with various issues in our culture, with, we wrestle with various temptations in a culture that is shouting lies at us, may we be courageous in the face of it, and may we learn 
to walk that balance, God, of speaking the truth, but always, always, always in love. In Jesus' name, amen.